So, uh, Tom, how long have you had the or lived here? I've lived here since 1973, my whole life. Uh, I'd, I'd never like to leave, to be honest. It's, I don't know, I, I think the salt water's in your bones. You like being, when you grow up beside the sea, you always want to be beside it. Yeah. It, it, what's, the, what's the best things about living by the sea here? What do you love about it? The biggest thing I love is having the bedroom window open at night when it's a calm night and listening to the sea. Okay. The, that sound really relaxing. Yeah. Uh, you'll have a great sleep. Right. The best sleep is listening to the sea. So the the tide is out now. Is is it usually out this far, or does it? What's it? What's the norm here? You're looking at that tide now. It's probably half an hour either side so to low water you'll be I'm not sure now if it's gone if it's still going out or coming in but you're close to the turning right, time right. at the minute and it always go out this far? it would yes yeah, okay. so like you're here now on the beach this is a blue flag beach we've held a blue flag for over 20 years consecutive one of the most important flags to be flown on any beach in the world yeah. uh, last year under the business against letter Clarahead was named as one of the cleanest beaches in the country okay. but again that comes from a lot of volunteers who clean the beach every day mm. morning afternoon evening just locals going for the walk bringing the litter off the beach mm-hmm. again yep. it's it's one of the safest beaches to swim on you very you you don't have a rip current here, so when you see the tide that's out there now when this comes in, it's not really that deep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like you can walk out that distance there at high tide, yeah, yeah. and swim safely. You can see it. It reminds me of a, a beach that I used to go to down the west called Myris, and you'd be ke- you'd keep on walking, you still couldn't get in deep enough to swim, you know. Yeah. So we're, we're going to walk this way, are we? We're heading over the headland now. Okay. So the first thing when we come to the headland is if you go back to 1955, Rock Hudson was here making a Hollywood film. Okay. Uh, Captain Lightfoot. So if you ever do watch the film, the first thatched house there to your left, you'll see that in the film. And then... You will see all the scenes acting out be just behind us. Okay. What was the What was the film about? Yeah. <laughs> well, that may be a wrong question. Okay. <laughs> all right. We'll keep going. Okay. And would there be Would there be Would there be much in in terms of surfing and stuff like that here? There'd, there'd be a few surfing. We see one out in the bodyboard this evening. It wouldn't be the, a big beach for surfing. The other side of the headland, you have another big strand. Okay. And uh, there'd be a good bit of surfing down there. Again, you, you wouldn't have that big a break of the wave here as you would off other beaches. Okay, I can see the guy there. He's skimming along. And you were saying something about the rocks here. What, what was that? That was quite interesting. The rocks, I will show you when we get over to explain it to you. Because you need to be standing there to see okay. the formation of these rocks. Okay. You know, when we get there, you'll be... I'm sure surprise and delighted. Yeah. You're very good for taking us out for a walk here. really appreciate it. So t- tell me, Tom, what's what's life generally like here, summer, winter? or What's life like in Clotterhead? Um, how many people live here? You've roughly around 2,500 people that's living now in Clotterhead. Okay. As when I would, was growing up, there would have been about six to 700 people. Okay. So, over the 90s, 2000s, really the population exploded here. We would have been one of the fastest growing uh, villages, towns in the county. So Clara had gone from a sleepy little fishing village to the fourth biggest town village in the county. Um, Would you have many people that uh, come and go or that live here permanently or live here transiently and come in? For holidays, that's, 
uh, you, you have the population that live here. Mm -hmm. Then obviously during the summer, you'll have the mobile homes and the chalets. Okay. So when we turn around here, you can see the, sh the chalets further up. And then you have the mobile home sites here. Okay. So that will... But around 2,000, I thought there would be more, yeah. 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 About 2,500 people within the village. There's a, an interesting stat that I noticed. We're, we're just after doing the census a couple of weeks ago. But uh, the last census, if you actually look at it and go through the stats and the figures, Dunlea, who everyone would turn automatically and say the population that is bigger in Dunlea. Mm -hmm. There's more houses in Dunlea than Clare Head. But yet we have a bigger population. And the simple thing is, in Dunlea, the average uh, children in a household is one, while in Clarehead it's 2.5. Right. Interesting. So it's bigger families here. Yeah. People kind of, who have come to settle within the, say, both communities, uh, obviously have more children mm. living beside the sea. Yeah, okay. Interesting statistic. What could be down to that? Is this the good sea air? Good fresh fish. Okay, yeah, yeah. I like that one as well. Hang Why on there. Yeah. You asked me about growing up in Clara Hay, though. Why you be so passionate about this area? We enter now. When I was growing up, this was my garden. Right. This is where I grew up. So my home house is just straight here in front of us. Okay. So we wandered these fields. Yeah. When we were hungry, we walked in the back door of any of these houses wow. and we were blessed. Because only now you realise it was all home bake and the food that we had. Yeah, yeah. Lord Mercy and Joan Hodgins up there was one of the best bakers in the country. Very good. And she proved that one year when she won the flow gas cooking competition yeah. years and years ago. Well, but it made no this, was, this was your playground? This is our playground, so if you're down here... And did you just have names for rocks or anything oh, like this, that? This field here was known as the Molly Wee. Right. This was the best mush mushroom. Right. So you'd be up early in the morning, 7 o'clock, half 7, to get your mushrooms out here. Wow. Back in, into the pot bay, milk and boil them, and that was your breakfast. Wow. Uh, like, we go in even when Lord Mercy and Mrs O'Reilly here in this house, who... Oh, their children would have been growing up and well gone at, when we would come along. We'd still go in the back door, get something to eat, and you'd be your way back down. Wow. You know. So what's ahead of us here? This is the cliffs, is it? This is really the start of the head, as we would call it, the, the headland walk. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so, so much history to it. And people come here every day and walk across this headland and don't realise uh, what significance it played, played in history, mm -hmm. what happened here. Uh, as you know, you were trying to book the smugglers' rest earlier on. Mm -hmm. Smuggling was a massive thing here down through okay. the years. Yeah. Uh, the Coast Guard was originally set up here. It wasn't the Coast Guard that we know today. The Coast Guard was more like the revenue. Yeah, yeah. was to stop the smuggling so you would have have a coast guard man on a horseback patrolling the headland trying to stop the smugglers mm -hmm. which the biggest thing the smuggling in then was tobacco uh, tea bags right. yeah. so the smugg smuggling was, has always been a part of our history but times have changed what they were smuggling <laughs> the, more diverse trades now <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you'd ever time, I love coming over here, and especially this corner, the the head, sitting out in the rocks. People are coming and going in behind you, but if you sit down in this corner and actually watch the wildlife, mm. you'll get a lot of different types of birds okay. sitting in the rocks here. Right. Obviously, they are taking their breather, their time out from their doing their fishing and. Yeah. It's all, all, all kind of jaggedy rocks here that we're looking at. Jaggedy. And you, you see the shape coming into it now, the flat. See the way these rocks off are flat mm. and standing upright. Again, when we get the other side of the head, 
this will all come. I'll explain how this formation happened. If you see the little water inlet they here running in between the rocks, yes. heading in, that's heading into a cave known as the Red Man's Cave. Now, the story behind the Red Man's Cave was that Captain Redman, a Spanish sailor, he set sail from Spain, heading north. But during the voyage, uh, a sailor kept passing every night. So every day they got up, there was another sailor dead. So they eventually got up the, the east coast of Ireland here, and there was only five sailors left along with Captain Redman. So there was bad weather, and they anchored off here and came in for the shelter. So they found this cave. So the first night had passed, another dead sailor. Second night passed, the same thing. So on the third day when they were here, the other sailors started talking. They, were, they reckon Captain Redman was uh, killing a sailor every night. So the three ganged together and they cut his head off. Spraying the walls with his blood, and that was became known as the Captain Redman's Cave. Mm -hmm. Now the other story behind Captain Redman is during the time when Cromwell was here. Now we all know who Cromwell was, especially what he did in Drogheda, and the streets of Drogheda turned red. During uh, Cromwell's time here, there was three Catholic priests hiding in the cave. Cromwell's man was patrolling, coming across the headland here. Went by, gran, but unfortunately the priest had a dog and the dog let it bark when he heard the horses. So Cromwell's man went down and did what they did best in the cave. And that's how it became Red Man's Cave, due mm -hmm. to the blood that was spilt in it. Wow, interesting. But we also spoke about the smuggler smuggling in the village. Mm -hmm. This cave there's a tunnel leads the full way up to Almond's town, directly over there. Goes up through the village. If you come down the Crooked Street, the road that you would have driven down to the beach, you'll actually see a plaque in one of the cottages there, which is the smugglers, known as the smugglers cottage. Okay, and that's where it comes out? That one comes out there. Directly here we see trees straight in front of us. There's an old castle there. There's another entrance to it there, and above an almond's town there was another entrance. Yeah. So they reckon that the smugglers used to bring in the rowing boats here into the caves and up through, yeah. smuggling it in that way. Fascinating. Okay. But again, uh, if we look at the castle that's here in these trees, in glass pistol, he, Oliver Plunkett, whose head is in St. Peter's Church in Drogheda. Well, during Cromwell's time, Oliver Plunkett was hiding out here. If he had a stain in his holidays in Clara Head, he might have kept in his head. But unfortunately, he moved on and ended up being arrested in Dundalk. Okay. Well, there you go. Tom, you were saying about the, the different types of birds that are here, that there's a lot of different types of birds. What's the... Do you have um, any groups here or...? There, there is board watching a uh, group that often come up here walking around to see what boards they can spot. You have a whale watching group that comes up here to try to spot the different whales or sharks going up through the sea here. We're here now at LOP tree, which was built in 1939. LOP and tree is significant. LOP1 is Green Oar, the very first one. Number two is straight here in front of us down towards Torco. Four, five, the full way around the country. I think it was 84, 85 LOP this was made. So it's the lookout post who the Coast Guard would have manned during the World War, detecting for any activity, whether shipping planes and would all be recorded and this one here there was three on duty every day so th this was operational straight away in 1939 now you have seen the log books from it so, so again there is one hour sink in the full country 
there was an afterthought and there was one built in carry, which is actually the final number. So if there's 84, that's number 84. If there's 85. Yeah. So in Donegal, you'll have 84. And down in Kerry, the only one that's yeah, out of sync is 85. 85. So again, as I explained earlier, you had the sign down there. Era 3. So that meant they were at this point. They were at 3. So again, Ireland was meant to be a neutral country. The British had the navigational of each one. So they knew that when they were flying over Era 3, they were at Clark Head. They had this information as the Germans wouldn't have. So, it's okay. a part of the war here. So, when we walk here, we see these little mounds. Locally, they're known as the Giant's Graves. Now, we know about the Giant's Grave and down in Cooley up the Cooley Mountains, but here, this was supposedly a graveyard. Younger, I was told, during the famine on headlands around the country, that they used to grow spuds or potatoes on top of headlands covered in seaweed. It was the only way to keep the plight out. Okay. So I reckon that's where these mounds come from. Right, yeah. yeah. So let's get back. Uh, race in the morning, when, when these lads would be rowing into Drada. And if you go back over 5,000 years ago, this trip was done before them, with, with the big curb stones to stand in front of Newgrange. So this race in the morning, they'd be doing it in time, they'd be sweating, they'd be busted again to get the draw, they'd be putting all their energy in. Now you go back over 5,000 years ago, when they did this rowing with big bowlers, mm. towing these big bowlers on rafts up into the river, river Bion and further on up to Newgrange, which there is argument what side of the head they came from. Some believe they were taken off either beach. Mm. I personally believe they came from down this end, but no one can say for sure. And is there, is there, do they see evidence of them, of stones being cut? You were saying there's, there's These, cuts here. Uh, they wouldn't have been cut out of the rock. These boulders were formed while the seismic shift was taken. It's here. I it. Yeah, I stepped down to the next level. Right, you come in here. Wow. And what is, what is this, Tom? It's a little shy, and it was put here many, many years ago, but majority of people will tell you it's there to keep the fishermen safe at sea. But that wasn't the real reason why it was put here. Uh, the landowner at the time, his cattle were mysteriously dying at night. And he put a statue of a lady here to try to protect them from whatever was killing them, which it worked. But over the years, it has been maintained to keep our fishermen safe at sea. It's not something you, you'll find if you don't know where it is. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you very much for showing us that. Someone had a bad shot. <laughs> I saw that. There's some view as well, when we look down. So if you look down there, you see a smaller stone, like the curb stone, that's at Newgrange. It's probably about yeah, a yeah, tenth yeah. the size of it. Yeah. So I imagine, like this area here was full of those curb stones, and maybe this is the one of the areas they were taken from from here to Newgrange. I'm over here, Tom. So, so we're here in County Loud, a border county. A, a border that was created by politicians. But there's a real border, and we're standing on it. You're in North America. You're in Europe. This is where the two plates, over 400 million years ago, collided, the seismic uh, collision. So when we look at the formation of the rocks here, you see that they're flat, they're straight up. So originally they were seabed. When the two, when the two continents collided, pushing the uh, sand or the seabed up straight. And this 
is the which border from here in Clara Hague County Loud right down to the Shannon Estuary in Limerick. There's uh, north of here is North America, south of here is Europe. Fossils that have been found north of here and south of here proves that. Again, if you look at it, it's seabed, so it's different soil. When you look around, you see the different flowers, the different fauna. They only grow here because of it. So there is some of these unique only to Clatterhead. You won't find them anywhere else in the country on this island. And they, they used to shoot the rock to it. Yeah. Exercising. So if we look, this is actually a bit of the sea pole. I don't know if you can see yeah. the Irish Coast Guard sea pole. So unfortunately, someone knocked it here oh, about 20 years ago and it was rotten uh, lying there in the headlands. So we took a bit of it down and encased it preserved. and preserved it now. What was that for? Just explain that to me again. It was a, it was a sea pole which stood up on the headland. It was used for training. The, so the sea pole was kind of what I believe was a mask on a boat. So there'd be someone up on the sea pole, and then there'd be someone with the lock, rocket launcher, which was sh shoot a rope to the casualty. So someone would open yeah. the pole and they'd be catching it, and they'd send a basket across. So, say if there was a boat out here, a real casualty, they'd send out a rope with a basket on it to pull in the casualties the casualty, from the boats. Yeah. Very good. Wow. The Coast Guard is here over 200 years now. Originally, as we said, it was the revenue years ago. Uh, the buildings have changed. This is the Coast Guard unit at the minute. This building there was a building here which also was the Coast Guard years ago. But then up here in the car park, in the centre part of the car park, there was a big Coast Guard unit built around the 1920s, early 1920s. It was, a f it was only there for a couple of years. The Civil War broke out in Ireland and it was burnt down. It was burnt to ruins. And this is where we have, and hopefully in over the next coming years we will have a new coast schedule unit built in Clarehead. Mm -hmm. Young lad making a few pounds, you'd be down to harbour every evening telling the prawns for a couple of hours, mm -hmm. giving the lads a hand. You know. Now, at the moment, if I know there's a few of our boats in the west, or uh, some are fishing in the back of the Aran Islands, or are out in the porcupine. A couple of the boats here that are in at the minute, they were fishing locally just out. Which, if, if, if it was possible at the minute, all boats would be love to be fishing here locally mm. with the price of fuel. Yeah. It's, it'd be enough, you, you'd uh, be making more just a couple of hours steaming out into the Irish Sea instead yeah. of steaming the full way around the country. and. Yeah and out into the porcupine. But again, we, we spoke about the famine earlier on. Clarahead is a fishing community. And it was the thing, as a young boy, as I always remember stories from all the people from the town of Drotter to telling you how the fishermen in Clarahead kept them going, sending in the fish to them, to feed them, when, when there was no potatoes when the starvation was here in the country. So with ourselves, Clara had plenty of food. Did fish. Yeah. You know. It has been the main provider here for decades. Unfortunately due to Brexit, we were one of the worst tech communities due to, to Brexit. With Europe uh, cutting the prawn quota and giving some of that to the British fishermen. Mm. Clarehead is the biggest prawn fleet in the country. Yeah. So we lost out on 30-40%. So you're looking at roughly last year 
we lose, our fishermen lose out in about two million of their quota every year. Uh, we believe that she stowed away on a ship from Drogheda to Liverpool and then from Liverpool to the States into New York. There is no, it's the only part of her life that there's no real document, so we're guessing that's how she did it. When she got to the States, everything documented about her is as Albert Cassio. So she lived, as far as we are concerned, she lived the rest of her life after leaving Clara Head as a man. Fought in the American Civil War, uh, meant to be very courageous, she was praised by her comrades. She eventually got discovered later in life when she got ill, or uh, when she got hurt in an accident. Now, she was knocked down, and she was brought to hospital, obviously. When she arrived at the hospital, they discovered her gender. She pleaded with them, and they didn't reveal it. But soon after that, Jenny got ill, and it was reported then that she was female. So at that time, the, obviously she was living on a pension from the war. So they wanted, the states wanted to take that pension off her because she wasn't meant to be fighting. But all her comrades stood up for her, the men who fought alongside her to make sure that she kept it because she was as brave as anyone else and she got to keep her pension. Oh, and what was her full name again? Jenny Hodgers. So in the village now we have a new mural done to Jenny. Jenny's in the picture with a, another soldier from our infantry. Unfortunately we don't know the other soldier's name. We have tried to discover it but we can't find it. So there was a photograph of her, was there? There's or, yeah. a good few photographs of her online, you'll find them. Yeah, yeah. All from the American Civil War. There's about five or six yeah. big good ones. Good. About Clara Head growing up or why you'd live here. The stories and the history. Yeah, I can see that. You know, yeah. I, I loved listening to stories from the old fishermen. Now, we, we went through an awful lot of histories from 400 million years ago to 5,000 years ago to 1939, the start of World War II. The history that's in Clara Head, I... I soaked it up as a child. I know that there's an awful lot of stories I could tell you walking this road about ghosts and the red-haired lady, fishermen's myths, again, I, which I love to listen. Yeah. And at times you'd often sit down and wonder, now, is that true or is that a made-up story? But as I said, I, I could speak for hours yeah, yeah. on different stories, ghost stories. So we, we may be back someday to, to go through some of the ghost stories. They're quite popular, aren't they, on YouTube, aren't they? It's like the number one thing on YouTube is see the ghost stories. Fishermen are very superstitious, always were. And one of the superstitions growing up was if you saw a red haired lady going to sea, you went home. It was unlucky. So if you passed a red head going to sea, you turned around and went home. You didn't go to sea in case something happened. So I know old fishermen here one morning were coming out this road and they knocked down a woman. Now the driver said she was redhead. They jumped out, there was no one there. So all the fishermen, white as ghosts, just turned around and went home to their beds. They did not go to sea.